Hello again there, folks. I'm the Lone Adventurer. Thank you very much for stumbling your way upon my channel. Today, we're going to be starting a playthrough of Ker Nathalus into the Midnight Throne, which is a dedicated solo game. Even as I say that, I notice it says single player and co-op, but it is certainly a solo player first game. It is a game designed so that it will work very well for the solo gamer. And it is a dungeon survival game, quite a brutal game in many ways. A game that is of the same lineage as games such as Four Against Darkness, D100 Dungeon, Note Quest, games like that where you are going into a dangerous location, generating the contents and the structure and layout of that dungeon location as you are playing. Now this is a game from Black Oath Entertainment, which is uh, more or less a one-man production company. It is designed by a guy called Alex T, who is a very prolific game designer. He designs a lot of games. I don't really know how he manages to design as many games as he does. And the games that he designs tend to be quite dark in nature, quite brutal, quite survival oriented. So generally you can look at your playthroughs of these games as a success if your character doesn't die. If they're thriving in any way at all, you're doing very, very well. Now, Alex T is a pretty awesome guy. If you haven't watched the interview with him over on the Dungeon Dive, I would recommend checking that out. And he's worth uh, following over on Drive-Thru RPG or on itch.io, so you can keep an eye out on when um, he's bringing new stuff out. As I said, his other games tend to be quite brutal as well. Now. Last year, Alex very kindly sent me a selection of his games. He sent me Broken Shores, Sacrifice, and Rift Breakers. I spent a little time getting into Broken Shores. I played a little bit of that. I spent quite a bit of time reading Sacrifice and enjoying uh, learning about the mechanics and the world and things like that. And Rift Breakers I haven't really had a chance to look at at all. And if I'm honest, I felt a little bit guilty that I had not covered any of Alex's games on the channel, given that he sent me uh, those games uh, very kindly. And also because he's the sort of person who's very engaged in the community, very supportive of the games that he produces. So I, I wanted to get one of his games to the channel, and I've wanted to do that for quite some time now. Now, Kern of Arles, is a game that I backed on Kickstarter. And more or less as soon as I read about it and I started to see bits and pieces that Alex was drip feeding during the campaign, I knew that this was going to be the first game that I brought to the Lone Adventurer channel from Alex's catalogue of games. And that's for a number of reasons, but I would say primarily Alex's games Although the ones that I have looked at, Broken Shores and Sacrifice, do have mechanical structures in place to ensure that the solo player knows what they need to do and how to progress in their game, they are still more towards the role-playing end of the spectrum. So you need to be quite confident playing those games and you need to sort of make character decisions and uh, know which attributes to turn to and sort of make independent decisions. And while I think Karl Nefalis does allow for that sort of play, it is a lot more structured than that. And the other thing is that Alex's games, at least uh, compared to games that I'm experienced with, 
tend to be quite sophisticated. There's a lot of stats. There's a lot of things you need to keep track of. Honestly, when I was playing Broken Shores, I found myself getting a little bit lost. No doubt with practice and more experience, that would not be the case. And certainly I enjoyed watching Ithaquas Bane's playthroughs of Broken Shores and he demonstrated quite um, how accessible that game in particular is. But for me, I got the impression that Kernathalus is going to be a easier proposition to get into. That being said, it is not a walk in the park, both in terms of getting your character to survive, but also in terms of learning the mechanics and keeping on top of all the stuff that you need to keep on top of in order to get into a good rhythm and experience everything this game has got to offer. But like I said, I have spent some time with it now. I haven't played through an entire uh, dungeon, an entire location, but I've played enough that I'm ready to bring it to you folks and uh, start a fresh game and uh, do it together because I've got a feeling that this is one that's going to last for quite some time here on the channel. I would say we are looking at a number of videos over a, a long period of time. I'm not, it's not going to be a one and done deal. I'm not going to be uploading a couple of videos and then being done with it. And the good thing about that is it will give us an opportunity to identify any errors that I'm making and uh, to talk about those and to correct them as the series goes on. This first video is just going to be an overview, I think, possibly character creation, or maybe the start of character creation. We will see. So probably I should just open the book, shouldn't I? Because that was quite a lot of talk without even opening the book. Final thing I will say is that some elements of this game are quite dark. Some of the monsters that uh, you encounter are quite gruesome. Nothing immensely horrific, but uh, compared to the games that I normally play, it might be that this one is um, a, a, a little darker. I guess that's kind of like a warning here at the top. So it says, Into the Midnight Throne was made possible thanks to the support of 637 brave souls that backed the project on Kickstarter. A million thanks. You're very welcome, Alex. It was a great one to be along for the ride on, and I'm very much looking forward to the first uh, companion zine, which at time of filming has not been finished. I think the writing's all been finished, but uh, Alex is waiting for some art from various people. Black Oaf Entertainment are very good at uh, ongoing support of their games. Um, and I've closed it again, haven't I? Never mind. Broken Shores, there's an expansion that came out for that last year. I think there's an ongoing um, series of zine uh, expansions, zine-sized expansions for uh, Sacrifice. So it's cool that he continues to support the games. And I'm looking forward to seeing what other cool stuff we get for this one. All right, Into the Midnight Throne. Welcome to Kernathalus. Into the Midnight Throne, a single-player dungeon crawler set in an endless necropolis. With the help of this book, you'll tell the story of your character, who after miraculously surviving an execution wakes up to realise their problems have just begun and that there are fates worse than death. So that is the setting, essentially. Kernathalus is this ancient, terrifying city that exists below the capital of uh, this land where it is set and you wake up atop a pile of bodies because you've been uh, uh, executed or so they thought and uh, you miraculously wake up since your execution was botched. You are a survivor executed or so they thought when they threw you down here and trapped in an endless nightmare. As you explore what's left of the once glorious Valorian ascendancy, you will uncover details about their buried history and customs while trying to survive the many undead horrors that now roam the vast catacombs, temples and chambers of the necropolis. So we've got the city of Valdonia 
as the heart of the Alderworth kingdom high above. But uh, we don't really have to think about that. What we are worried about is the world below, is where we are stuck. So beneath the twisted spires and darkened streets of Veldonia lies a vast and chilling underworld known as Kernathalis, the Midnight Throne. This sprawling necropolis is all that remains of the once mighty Valorian ascendancy, a long forgotten empire of necromancers whose legacy still haunts the present. Although there are many entries into this vast underground complex, most of them are fiercely guarded by the Obsidian Wardens, a knightly order sworn to the protection of humanity against the horrors from below. Still, the Wardens cannot be everywhere at all times, and many entries are used for garbage disposal or similar activities. So we are in this vast and sprawling complex of crypts, catacombs and uh, places of that nature beneath the city. And the aim of the game really is to uh, survive and just to make your way through the uh, different areas that you'll be generating and uh, try and build your character up a little bit to the point where maybe they're doing all right and they stand a chance at uh, becoming stronger. I don't know, maybe getting out? I don't know if that's a possibility. I'm not really sure. So looking at this table of contents here, this first uh, major section is creating your survivor. And you can see this great big long list of masteries. And a lot of effort was put in to creating these, what are essentially like character classes. In this game, you don't play a fighter or a rogue or a wizard. You don't have a um, race such as elf or dwarf. The, um, the, the main way that your character is distinguished is by selecting two of these masteries, at least initially. And those masteries give you particular skills that you can use and give you skill trees so that you can continue to develop those skills as your character improves. And they are quite thematic and interesting and varied. I'm not really sure which ones of those we're going to use in this playthrough. I've got a little bit of an idea about Certainly, I want a different combination than what I've been playing so far, but we'll get into that later. Then you've got the rules, um, but then you've got uh, rules about exploring Kernathalis. So that's really all about how you generate the domains. Each sort of dungeon area is called a domain. How you generate those areas and uh, we've got uh, quite a few um, tables in there for a random generation of events and things like that. This game has a wealth of tables, if that's something you're a fan of. Then we've got uh, the details of combat encounters, so all the different monsters that you can face, along with the overseers. Each domain has an overseer that you face Eventually, once you have fully explored the domain, um, before you move on to the next one, do you have to face them? I'm not sure that you do. You can optionally face them before you move on to the next domain. But facing overseers gives you quite a lot of XP. And then at the back, we've got spoils and loot, various tables of weaponry, armor, loot, spoils, gear, magic items, etc, etc, etc. All right, so as is usually my way, I'm not really going to show you the rest of the book until we are actually using it. What we need to do is just start building a character. Everything else will be revealed as we are playing. So let's do that, shall we? I'm just gonna bring in the character sheet and we'll take a look at that. All right, here we are. What have we got? We've got a lot. And not all stuff that I've used, and not all stuff that I sort of know about necessarily. Certainly on this page, I have a pretty good handle on what's going on. We have a name, we have a level, we have a place where we can track our XP. 
We have health, we have toughness. When you run out of health, you are a gonon. Your character is no more. Toughness, you sort of have two levels of damage that you can take. Essentially, most of the time, you will be uh, reducing your toughness as the character takes damage. And it's only once your toughness has been fully reduced that you start to take damage to your health. I think there are various circumstances when your health takes direct damage, but when you are healing, you are healing either your toughness or your health. So both those things are uh, ways to track the slow and painful demise of your character. Then you've got ether, which is used for magical stuff. So if you've got 15 ether, you can do 15 points worth of magic bits and pieces. Sanity, you start with a certain amount and it slowly gets eaten away as your character uh, experiences and witnesses the sorts of things that you would imagine would eat away at your sanity. Magic resistance is a number that you roll against if you uh, are targeted by some kind of magical attack. Damage modifier, ah, I guess, is a way of tracking. There are various ways that your damage that you are causing can be modified. I didn't spot that when I was playing previously, that there is a place to pop that number so that you uh, know how you're modifying your damage. I'll look into that a little bit more later. Then you've got exhaustion. Your character gets more and more exhausted as you're going, and at a certain point, negative things start to happen. Light sources are important in this game. You have to have a light source, otherwise you're plunged into darkness. If you're plunged into darkness, I think that's pretty bad. I don't know exactly what happens, but I do know that you want to keep your light source up and running. Then we've got a whole bunch of skills that are all pretty important. A place to keep track of your weapons, a place to keep track of your masteries. That was uh, the um, ways to differentiate your character that I mentioned earlier, the different masteries that you can have, and then the different skills abilities that that mastery gives you strap in we we're not done yet there's quite a few sheets although less detail on these ones uh, perks and madness i'm not sure i've had a perk or uh, any madness yet i'm just looking at my character sheet from my existing game no no perks no madness thus far we've got a notes section and then we've got an area for the various vulnerabilities that your character can um, have. So they might be immune to certain things, they might be vulnerable to certain things, resistant, I'm not sure what restored is for, um, but, but more stuff to track, plenty of stuff to track. Then we've got gear, lots of uh, bits and areas for gear there. Do you know what, let's skip over that and we'll, we'll come back to it as, we're, as, we are, um, as we're doing our setup. Then we've got the uh, domain sheet. You need one of these sheets, I think, pretty much for every domain that you play through. Up here we've got tracking areas for the tension die and the lair and domain exit die. The tension die gradually adds uh, growing darkness events, uh, an increasing list of ways that the current domain is kind of a crappy place for you to be. And the Lair Domain Exit die allows us to uh, progress towards the point where we know where the Overseer is located and we know where the exit to the current domain is. Each Overseer has an influence, just a way that they make your life more difficult when you are in their domain. And then we've got some notes that we can keep here related to the domain as well. Easy peasy. Then I've got a sheet there to uh, draw the domain as we are going. I think I need to uh, make more effort to uh, track the details of the domain. I'm going to use this sheet, I think, a lot more than I have done previously to keep notes as I'm going so that we can remember all the different things that have happened as we are playing. But obviously, first, we need to make our character. 
All righty, so let's turn to the character creation section. There's a number of reasons why Alex's games appeal to me. I'm not necessarily hugely drawn to really dark material, but I am drawn to interesting, well-realised worlds, and certainly the Black Oath Entertainment games provide that. I'm also drawn to games that place a great deal of emphasis on making them accessible to solo players, and these games provide that as well. And also I'm very drawn to games where the writing is good. And Alex's writing is good. And that's not always the case with these games. The writing is not only accessible and easy to understand, but when it comes to describing the settings and the creatures within, the, the writing is just very effective. So you're probably going to end up listening to me reading out quite a few chunks of, these, of this book, is what I'm getting at. So we're at the start of the Creating Your Survivor section. I am going to read out the intro, deal with it, Skip ahead a minute if you don't want to hear it, but here we go. Before you even open your eyes, a wave of nauseating stench hits you, immediately causing you to heave the bitter taste of bile in your mouth. Your whole body hurts, and you can feel an intense burning around your neck. With some hesitation, you manage to sit up from the pile of soft refuse you appear to be lying on top of. To your horror, you quickly discover that this is not garbage, but a pile of decaying human corpses. Bloated faces and sunken eyes stare blankly at you. Illuminated by a single ray of sunlight coming from very high above your head, a flood of memories comes rushing back. You were executed. You quickly stand up, your head swimming, while you check your throat you immediately wince in pain, the flesh tender to the touch. There's no doubt about it, you were hung. You try to speak, but the words come out as a grunt, your throat too damaged and dry to produce any other sound. You turn away from the rotting pile of flesh and look around you. You find yourself within a empty chamber, the only light coming from a hole some thirty metres above. There's no way you'll be able to climb back up there. Rats the size of cats edge around you, nibbling on the dead, too fat and well-fed to even bother hiding or fighting each other for the best bits. Ahead of you, you see what appears to be a crack in the wall, wide enough for you to go through. There's no doubt in your mind where you are. Kernathalus. The Midnight Throne. Everyone in Valdonia has heard the stories about this vast underground necropolis that was once the capital of the Valorian Ascendancy, before their demise. You also know that nobody has ever come back alive from such a place. Considering you're in rags, injured and exhausted, your chances are not good. Somehow, though, you've cheated death and there must be a way out of here. Hesitantly, you head towards the breach in the wall, hoping to find something you can use to increase your chances of survival. So we need to get into it, and we've got our first table here. Which crime were you accused of? Now, there's a few tables in this book that are here purely for flavour. They have no mechanical effect and this is one of those tables there's not many most of the tables do uh, uh, lead to some game effect but I would say this one doesn't unless you are getting into the role playing and imagining your character a bit more fully but it's nice to have 16 fraud pretending to be something you are not to gain sympathy, regard or money. This might include pretending to be a veteran of the Escalian Wars, selling phony cures or masquerading as a priest, noble or similar person of station. All right, 
So I'm just going to write that in my character notes section, just so we know that our crime was fraud. And let's say that we were accused of masquerading as a noble. Now we've got some character attributes that we need to generate. Firstly is our health. Health is calculated by rolling d6 and adding 8. Okay, quite low, but let's let's go with it anyway. So that is uh, d6 and adding 8, so that is... Uh, was it adding 8? Is that what I said? Yes, so that's 8, 9, 10. So we've got a total of 10 health. Toughness. As I said, toughness is also essentially... Your HP is your health and your toughness combined. So your toughness is the thing that tends to be reduced when you're in combat most of the time. Initial toughness is 2d6 plus 10. So 7 plus 10, so we've got a toughness of 17. Uh, we should have done a name. I'm not very good at names. How about we honour one of um, the collaborators? Who have we got here? We've got additional art by Carlos. Dungeon Geomask by Glynn. Interior art by Jose Antonio Avila Herrero. Mihailo M. How about we go for one of Josie's middle names? How about Antonio? Incidentally, the interior art in this game is really nice. Look at that. It's pretty cool. I will have used one part of this art somewhere as the... Um, placeholder image for these videos. I'm not sure which one I'm going to use yet. That's pretty gruesome. Some terrifying beasties down here in Kernathalus. But yeah, some really nice art. Alex always makes the effort to uh, distinguish his games um, by working with particular artists. It's good to see. Right, so that is toughness, ether. So this is our spiritual and psychic power. D6 plus 8. Oh, okay, interesting. So we've got 13 ether. Sanity represents your character's ability to remain fully lucid and sane despite the many horrors they witness. Again, that's D6 plus 8. Four. So that's 12 sanity. And obviously we've got the uh, max on the right. And then we've got the number on the left that will be being reduced as we play. I kind of like the fact that you roll dice as part of uh, the process there. Because we're not going to be doing that for the skills. But it's kind of cool to do that for those uh, main stats there. There's kind of a sort of a retro feel to that, isn't there? Like the fighting fantasy books. You roll a dice, and that's your lot in life. Okay, so magical resistance. This is um, our first skill, essentially, but it's kept separate uh, for reasons. Now, the skills and magical resistance, these are uh, point scores out of 100. So it's a uh, roll-under um, system. So if we were to have to make a magic resistance roll, we would roll D100, so 2D10, and we would be aiming to roll at or below that score. Basically, that is not a particularly good score. That's what you're starting at, and you have to roll at or below 20 out of 100 in order to resist some terrifying creature's mag magical ability that is uh, currently threatening you. But that's magical resistance. Then we've got exhaustion and exhaustion resistance. So exhaustion represents fatigue, exposure, hunger, injuries and things like that. A character's exhaustion resistance score is subtracted from their current exhaustion total. New characters start with zero exhaustion resistance. 
Then we've got to do our skills. Now this should be interesting because now that I've played a little bit of this, it's a bit more apparent to me which of these skills are important. So what we're going to be doing is assigning uh, values to these skills based on these options here. Some of them have a starting amount, so you always get 10 in athletics and acrobatics and dodge, 20 in perception, 10 in resolve, and 20 in unarmed combat and fist weapons. And then anything from our, um, our allotment over here that we choose to add, we would be adding on top of that. So we're gonna be adding 60 to one weapon skill. Well, that's interesting. This is my old character sheet. Uh, okay, so I had 60 on bladed weapons. I then rather foolishly chose a shafted weapon and I've got 40 on shafted weapons. So I spent my whole previous game fighting with a weapon that relied upon my second best weapon skill. So that would have made a big difference. All right, so we're gonna be adding 60 to one weapon skill, 40 to one weapon skill, 30 to three skills, 20 to 3 skills and 10 to 4 skills. Probably you don't need to see me faffing about and making those decisions. I think what I'll do is I will pause the video and I'll bring you back once I have done the assignment and we'll talk about what we've done and why I've made those decisions. All right, that was pretty tough. Had to make some tough decisions there and I think it's inevitable that you end up with areas of weakness, which is gonna be really frustrating as we are setting out on our first uh, game with this character, with Antonio, but such is life, there you go. So starting with my largest allotments, I did the uh, plus 60, again on the bladed weapons. I'll just make sure that this time I've got a bladed weapon combat is going to be so much easier now that I've got 60 on a weapon or now that I know I've got 60 on a weapon and then uh, I had to do plus 40 on a secondary weapon skill I went for the shafted weapon again bludgeoning I left at zero I didn't use up any of my other allotment on that particular skill, wanting to focus on getting other things up. Then I had to do plus 30 on three skills, and I went for endurance. Endurance uh, allows you to avoid damage by being poisoned and getting diseases. I seem to remember using that a couple of times, so we've got 30 on that. Now I've also put 30 on perception, which feels possibly a little bit frivolous, given that everybody always starts out with a base of 20 on perception. So adding on 30 means that I've got a perception of 50, but perception is the skill that you use in combat to establish who goes first. And if you win that initial uh, roll to see who goes first, you get plus 20 to your first attack. And that is super, super handy. And I have to say, the first uh, game that I played with this, what I found most frustrating was my inability to quickly dispatch enemies. I think I faced five, and two of the ones that I faced I didn't even manage to kill at all. I just had to slink off uh, uh, in having failed. So that perception bonus there is really going to help. And then I also did plus 30 on scavenge, because who doesn't like scavenging? I do and uh, I want to be good at scavenging, so that's what I went for. Then we had to do plus 20 on three skills. I did plus 20 on medicine, which has no base uh, value, so that's given me uh, 20 for medicine. Uh, then resolve. Now resolve is all about your ability to withstand the psychological impact 
of exposure to the horrors of the necropolis. So anything that threatens your sanity, you have to do a resolve check to see whether uh, you go more insane. So I thought probably I should put something in that. So we've got 30 on resolve because I added on 20. And I also put 20 into thievery, which is your ability to open locks which, amongst other things anyway, affects your ability to open locks. So I thought that'd be quite handy. Then we had to add 10 onto four skills. So I added 10 onto athletics to give, oh, that should be a total of 20 on athletics there. I added on 10 onto dodge, which, you know, does what it says on the tin. Uh, so that gives us a 20 on dodge. I added 10 to Reason, which has no base score, so that means I've just got a mere 10 points on Reason, so I guess my character is not the smartest tool in the shed. added 10 onto Stealth, so I've only got 10 on Stealth, which feels quite rubbish, but there you go, you've got to have some weak spots. I didn't add anything onto Acrobatics, so we've only got the base score of 10 on Acrobatics, and I think that covers everything. Oh, an unarmed combat, you have a base score of 20, so we've just got 20 on that one. So there you go, that's skills. And then we're on to masteries. Now masteries is going to require a little bit of chit chat. We've also got to select a weapon and do a couple of other things, so I think I am going to have to stop there and split this uh, initial uh, setup uh, section into two videos. So in the next video we'll go through masteries, We'll do the final bits and pieces of um, character creation and we'll get our first domain set up and ready to go. Maybe possibly do the first room of the domain. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But there you go. That's the first video of uh, my playthrough of Kernophalis. Hope you enjoyed it, folks. If I made any errors, do feel free to drop a comment below and let me know so that we can... Uh, correct things and make sure we are getting everything as right as possible going forward. Otherwise, just uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.